she should have stayed put. Yeah. Okay, everybody. So our next session is uh, security and identity. Uh, to moderate this session, we have Michael Coates from <laughs> Shape Security. Well, really excited to be here. We've got a great panel lined up. I think we're going to have some very interesting conversations. Uh, as everyone probably knows, uh, security is not easy. Not that anything else we talked about today was easy. Uh, but there are certainly some loaded topics, and uh, I'm really excited for some good feedback and comments from the audience. Uh, as a reminder, so we can uh, highlight you on the live stream, do stand up when you ask a question. Uh, so we'll get, uh, get all of you in that. Uh, briefly introducing everyone, um, starting over here to my right, we've got Mark Nottingham uh, at Akamai. He comes to us from Australia. Uh, WG Chair for HTTP2. Uh, tons of work on protocols and formats. Um, some stuff on RSS, Atom, web services, all sorts of good stuff. No? Not web services. Not web services. I never did. Service. Nothing there. Okay. <laughs> and encryption, time at EFF, and also working on HTTPS every and secure drop, among other things. Chris, Francisco, uh, ID Foundation, uh, work with identity in the browser, UX, in Tokyo co-chair of the Web and Mobile Interest Group, uh, and lots of information on the mobile front. And Mike, coming from Google, based in Munich, uh, lots of work with the Chrome privacy team. Uh, items like HSTS, uh, mixed content, maybe not HSTS, but we'll talk about that. It's on my agenda, certainly. Uh, mixed content and content security policy. So we'll kick things off uh, with a brief presentation from Yan. Okay. Uh, so I think my name is pronounced Jan, but it's OK if you, you guys mess it up. Um, so welcome to the security and identity session. Um, yeah, identities are fluid. Okay, so uh, so I hope to convince you that this is one of the more interesting sessions. Um, but my perspective is honestly very biased because security is so broad. So I will definitely not cover the whole, whole scope of what you can ask during this session. Um, so how many of you have ever felt insecure because you know you're insecure about your job or your love life or finances. Um, so some of us haven't felt any of those things, but we still use Quora. And when you use a site like Quora that has you know, 10 million-ish monthly active users, um, you are sending your password and username over plain HTTP. And I checked this like a month ago. Right? Like, they're not, not just serving the login form over HTTP, they're actually sending the post request over plain HTTP. And this is 2014, and why are we not angry? Um, well, SSL is hard, <laughs> but let's try to make it easier. And that's one of the themes we'll talk about. Um, so how many people recognize this slide? How many people have heard of Edward Snowden? OK, so Edward Snowden sort of put um, HTTP, uh, made HTTP look much worse than it did before. Because we saw things uh, in essay slides that say, why are we interested in HTTP? Um, because HTTP allows the NSA to do mass surveillance. You know, according to these slides, um, and so um, what you know. Previously, we would say if you use HTTP, someone at your coffee shop can sniff your traffic and read your passwords, and that's bad. But now we can say, oh, now the NSA can collect all your traffic and index it, and into a a very ugly GUI like this that you see. Um, so. What, uh, what are people doing about this? Um, I'm sorry this is a little bit small to see, but um, I, I used to work at the EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation. And about a year ago, we asked people, um, we asked major service provider uh, websites, which of these things do you support? Um, so the categories are encrypt data center links, support HTTPS on your website, uh, support HTTP strict transport security, uh, support HTTPS with forward secrecy and support start TLS, which is in, uh, transit encryption for mail. And when we started, there was a lot more red. Um, and I don't have a before slide. But now you can see we have a lot more green. And we have a lot more companies that say, we're working on this, you know, plan quarter two, 2014. This is in progress. Um, and people don't often talk about email when they talk about HTTPS, but it's also really important. Um, 
So we have also seen that since uh, December 2013, email encryption has risen about 33 to 58%. Um, uh, and, and now people are saying, oh, web traffic encryption has doubled more than, uh, more than uh, I guess, more than doubled after some of the NSA revelations. So uh, more exciting things are happening uh, this year. So WordPress is moving to support uh, SSL uh, fully, and that's a huge percentage of traffic as well. Um, but what's, what else is going on um, other than HTTPS support um, becoming much more popular these days? Uh, so Chromium ha is uh, in Firefox, and the browsers are, are implementing Web Crypto. In fact, I think uh, Chrome 37 is out already, right? So this is, this is already passed. Um, so this will allow people to more easily do crypto in a browser, which, which we see more and more of these days. Um, so uh, more interesting, uh, sorry, not more interesting, but another thing that's, ha that's happening is uh, HTTP public key pinning. So uh, websites will be able to say, like, these are the certificate authorities we expect you to see, um, and, or these are the certificates that we expect you to see. Um, and uh, so Firefox 32 uh, now supports that. Okay. Um, another in, uh, cool initiative is certificate transparency. So certif how many people here are familiar with that? Okay, no, very few. So, uh, so essentially, we, um, certificate transparency guarantees that if you see a certificate um, from a CA, it is publicly logged, and people can go back and check those logs and detect attacks. And this goes again, this helps mitigate the problem that you know, any CA can issue a bad certificate for you. Um, you know, currently. So, um, and Chris Palmer and other people at Google Security are saying, um, let's, let's, in, let's, let's create greater incentives for people to support HTTPS and prefer secure origins for powerful new web features. And so, uh, secure is HTTPS, uh, secure web sockets, and local, um, local protocols as well. So, local IPs, rather. Um, and I'm sure Mark, Mark will say a lot more about this, but HTTP2 is out, and one of the big questions is, should encryption be the default? You know, should we still have to think about setting up SSL certificates, or should it just be automatically you know, part of the protocol and something that is like, inherent that you have to use if you're going to use HTTP2? Um, but you know, not everything's great. So we saw with Heartbleed this, uh, earlier this year that uh, certificate revocation is still very hard <coughs> to do. Um, and this is a very funny diagram that shows uh, after, so the number of sites that reissued certificates after uh, Heartbleed is uh, 43%. But only 20% of those, uh, only 20% revoke certificates. And of those, 7% issued the same key like the same private key that was compromised by Heartbleed, presumably, was reissued in the certificate. So the point of this is that SSL management is very hard for people, right? Like even with a Heartbleed, which we saw, which everyone said was a disaster, um, we didn't react as well as we could as, as um, people who maintain servers and so forth. Um, so another thing that keeps happening is password breaches. And we'll talk about um, why passwords are so difficult. But I think for most of us, we don't realize how hard passwords are for the average person until we see these leaked password breach data. So this is from the Adobe one earlier this year. Oh, we're at Adobe. Uh, I didn't even think about that. Um, <laughs> oops. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we, so um, Adobe was encrypting passwords instead of like salting and hashing them. So it was fairly easy to uh, Revert, do statistical analysis and get the plain text passwords back. And so um, what people didn't realize, well, what might not have been obvious is that people's password hints, which may not be stored encrypted at all, are often just their password. So even if you're you know, doing salting and hashing, people's password hints say, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's their <coughs> password a lot of the times. And um, or rhymes with password is probably <laughs> password, right? So, so what's our user model here? We have to think about people who are not, you know, good at passwords, and what are some ways we can either make passwords better or replace them. Um, and I don't know if we'll talk about this, but uh, uh, something that has been in the news a lot lately is third-party tracking in browsers. Um, so this is from a while ago, but. 
you know, the question, here's a question is, um, will, will browsers implement third party cookie blocking? You know, even if there's so much incentive for advertisers to, uh, to use this sort of tracking. So what can browsers do? You know, um, so that's a comic. And uh, I, you know, none of this was about identity, so, but you can still ask about identity because that's in the title of the session. Yeah, sorry, Chris. <laughs> cool, uh, yeah, that's it. Great, well, why don't we just dive in here? I mean, a lot of the topics that you mentioned on in current events talk about you know, SSL encryption. I mean, it, it seems like a no-brainer. We don't want our data to be exposed in the clear. We don't want governments to monitor what we do. We don't want our passwords, uh, regardless of how they're stored, which is a whole other issue, just to be handed out to everyone next to us at a coffee house. Uh, so our first question along this uh, topic comes from Andrew Betts, and is uh, setting up SSL is too hard today. What is the single biggest cause of this? And what can we do to make it much easier and faster? And to continue along with this, uh, Jan, uh, why don't you give us some of your thoughts? Sure. So I think uh, setting up SSL uh, very like the, the complexity of the process varies a lot depending on whether you're just someone with like a one-page website or if you're a company like Yahoo or Twitter. Um, but if even let's say the like the simpler case where you're just someone with a website who wants to set up SSL, it's still a large number of steps. So you have to like go to a website, you have to pick a certificate authority, buy it, make sure you put it in the right folder, restart your server, and all that. And so I think something that's really that's really great is that um, CDNs like Cloudflare. I don't know if I should call them a CDN in this context, but they're thinking about you know providing free SSL to all their customers um, and making that setup process automatic. And there's several other organizations that are think like like for instance um, like if you're a payment site like Stripe you might say we want all of our customers to use SSL so why don't we make it as easy as possible and make it a one-click process so that's something people have been thinking about is one-click SSL setup for the very simple case. And Mark, do you think we should have to go through any of this effort at all? Should it just be the de facto of how we do things? Well, so we've talked about that a lot in the IETF in terms of making it the default for HTTP2. Um, I think, you know, there, there's the administrative load of getting the cert configured. There's the load of, of modifying your content, which for a lot of people is, is where most of the work is. If you have a lot of content, you know, it changes the way the web security model works. Um, once you get past those, you know, that's a transition phase you need to go through it becomes a lot easier. Um, and I know there are some efforts out there to make all this easier. There's BetoCrypto.org, which is how do you set up good crypto. Um, people are working on making it easier to install the cert on the server with NPM libraries or whatever. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, should individuals have to be doing this? I mean, if it's, if so it's hard, are yeah. Are you asking about opportunistic security? Are we going there already? So one of the, one of the proposals out there is that uh, to use what we call opportunistic security, to use TLS under the covers, but not change the URL, keep it HTTP, uh, not change the security context, so no lock icon. It's just protecting against passive attacks. So this is that's a terrible idea. Well, this has and been a very yeah. controversial, as and I was about to say. It doesn't actually remove any of the burden of setting up anything, right? You still have to oh, generate a cert. You still have to install it in your server. But you can server. do all that automatically. A good service yes. implementation can do that without any intervention whatsoever. If you look at like sslmate.com, they yeah. actually have an API to sure. generate normal certs that yes. you can also automate. So yes. it's not the case that But you still have to install the, the cert. Sign. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, and which you can also automate. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so I'm not arguing for opportunistic security. I think it's interesting. Uh, the Mozilla guys are, are playing with it. I'd say it's experimental from their standpoint. Mm -hmm. I know the Chrome security guys are Less raining down hellfire, I would yeah. say, is probably a good way. They really don't like Unenthusiastic. it. Unenthusiastic. And, and I can understand that because it, it you know, reduces the deployment of, of TLS. And I think we have broad agreement of most people on the panel that more deployment <laughs> of, of, of HTTPS and TLS is a very good thing. Um, the places where it gets a lot harder are things like Internet of Things or, or your printer or something on your local network. Right. That's really hard, and I think that part of the community needs a lot more love. Mm. Like, it's easy to say, oh, yes, we're going to get to that one day, but I don't see the browsers focusing on it yet. Yep. So if there's, if, if 
they still need, <coughs> if content providers still need to go and install a certificate, then how, how does it ease the situation for them? What is, what is easier for them? Opportunistic. Yeah. Yeah, opp because uh, they, don't have to get it, they don't have to get it signed. It doesn't have to be signed by a certificate authority. So it can be generated by code. It can be installed and configured by code. Uh, the idea is that from an administrator circumstance, you don't do anything. It just happens. Okay. Um, and so that is easier because well, the administrative load is not nothing yet. You don't do anything except setting up all the machinery such that it works. Like, I can't get away from the idea that you still have to do the work to, get, to generate certificates no. and install them. So you, have to, you have to set up the scripts, right? No. Yes. A good implementation, and again, this implementation does not yet exist. OK. But so. it, <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's like, I don't even know if it's in Firefox Nightly yet. I'd have to ask Patrick. Um, but the, the idea would be that the, the server side would generate the cert on its mm -hmm. own and configured on its own. Mm -hmm. Right now the problem is the out of the box Apache or IAS or whatever configuration is not the best configuration. It's the default. It would be a huge win for us all if the defaults were better. Mm -hmm. But this is a fight that has happened in those communities for a long time. They're not quite there yet. So what is the value of opportunistic encryption given that it can be completely removed by dropping a single HTTP header? Right. Uh, you have a downgrade attack. You have uh, 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 man in the middle attacks. Any active attack can take over. And right. the question is, how, what are the consequences of the attacker going active, and how willing are they going to be to go attack, uh, well, active? Given so, so, you know, most of the attacks we've seen exposed by Snowden have been passive. Uh, Jacob Applebaum argues very strongly that, you know, having protection against those packs, passive attacks is a win. But yes, we know that some state actors aren't, are very willing to go active. I wouldn't even say state actors. You have ISPs that are injecting JavaScript. <laughs> And this is true. reconfiguring your uh, everythings, which is and, not awesome. And the interesting thing to me is, is that that leaves evidence. You know, when, when they go active, you can tell they've gone active. And what's really interesting is the Comcast, you can refer to the yeah, Comcast com ad yeah. injection. There's been a reaction to that, yeah. but as far as I'm aware, they're still doing it. Yeah. You know, it's not like they've been stopped by people going, oh, no, they're putting ads in there. Right, that's kind of my point. But they're still doing is it. Is that it's not just state actors that we need to worry yeah. about. It's really anyone between you and the server that you want and to And that's what to. I worry about in all of this, in both directions, is acclimation. When, when users get used to their security being degraded, or mm -hmm. they just come to expect, oh, that's just how things work on the internet, right. we're all in a worse place. I completely yeah. agree. So I'd love to get some people queued up in the audience with some thoughts on SSL. So uh, ring in, and we'll get uh, some microphones your way. Uh, let's go ahead and get uh, a couple of those out there. Um, in the meantime, before this uh, <coughs> exists, anything we can do to make it easier today? So like I said, I think SSL Mate Dot com is a website that I think is really interesting because they're starting to put an API in front of uh, certificate generation. So you have a script on your server, you say, please generate me a new certificate, and it does the work of using the key or generating a key and then going out, uh, generating the CSR, grabbing a cert, and doing all the work for you, which I think is a really interesting model. Uh, I'd like to see more of that. What I'd really like to see is work being done by, um, by the providers. So. It's not something that I think browser vendors are really well placed to solve. It's something that I think needs to be done at a server level and at a uh, provider level. So if someone, when someone like WordPress or someone like uh, Cloudflare does work and submits patches back to the open source systems, I think that's a really healthy relationship. And I'd like yeah. to see more of that happening. Great. Yeah, I'd like to see the Apache plugins and just to make those really easy to use together. Yeah. yeah. Good. Actually, one more thing on that. So my friend Tantic last night sort of pointed out that the IndieWeb organization and community have worked on this, and they've got a bunch of documentation up at IndieWeb.org slash HTTPS if you want to put on your own server. So mm -hmm. there's some efforts in that, in that sense as well. It's kind of like better crypto, the same, yeah. Sort, yeah. same sort of idea. Good. All right, out to the uh, audience. We've got uh, Guy. There we are. I just wanted to point out that there's the technical aspect of it, of installing it, but there's also the certificate validation, which is a part of the pain point. And I think there the challenges are very different. I mean, if we do domain validation, you can see automation and making that very easy. But when you're talking about organizational validation or extended validation, those are processes that at least today are a part of the trust model we're educating our users about with all sorts of signals on the browser. Um, and as long as we're there, then you know there's somebody that needs to call up or, or look up another person. And at least kind of in the ACMA experience, a lot of times those are the bottlenecks versus the technologies. And I guess I'd claim that those have no value. Mm -hmm. That friction is actually part of the yeah, point. So they may have no value, but if we do that, then if that is the claim, then you need to provide an alternative or, or, think, or think, claim what it is that you're giving up. Yeah, I think um, from, from my perspective, uh, domain validation is enough. Like if I prove that I own the domain and I 
pin the cert to my domain, uh, proving that I you know, totally own it, uh, then that's fine. I don't need EV. I don't need a green bar. There's really no value to that whatsoever. You mean, you mean pin or HSTS? Both. So I, I pin my cert to my domain. Um, is your browser uh, acknowledging that pin? Uh, I don't know if uh, public key pins has shipped as a header. I know that we support public key pins in the, uh, in the preload list in both mm -hmm. Chrome and Firefox yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, I would have to ask folks whether we yeah. support it on the open I web. I think it's not yet supported. I right. think Chrome has, the, has basic support for the header, mm -hmm. but Firefox has not. Okay. Yet. Right, but yeah. regardless, that's going to happen at some point. Right. So, uh, <coughs> but you can get yourself in trouble with that too. You can Absolutely. get yourself in a place where you yes. walk all of your users out of your totally. server. And yeah. that's kind of bad. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I, I feel like we need even more best practices around all mm -hmm. this because the, the process of getting a cert and configuring in all these different little tiny holes you can get yourself in is still very confusing even to someone who does this a lot. You know, it's, it's, we can do a lot better. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see here. We've got uh, Alex. Uh, Mark, to your point, um, I'm, I'm very curious to know what folks on the stage or the organizations you work for are doing to make it much easier to get a system image, like you know, a DMG or something, um, for a VM and just get it up and running with good security. Because today my experience is that if you take an Ubuntu image and you set it up, and you set up Apache, and you attempt to get your site encrypted, you're going to end up with a very bad configuration. You're going to have the wrong order for Cypher suites. You're going to have right. no HSTS. Right. You're just going to be pretty much boned out of the box until you figure out all of these little fiddly bits. Right. Um, what can we do to make it so that the distro vendors have some skin in the game here? So that's a good question. I think, you know, like, so when I switched my site to HTTPS, I followed Better Crypto and deviated slightly from it. But we have, we have guides like Better Crypto. We have the SSL Labs uh, tester, which is a great resource. I wish that it was a little easier for people to find. Um, be, but actually convincing the distros, my experience is you go to the distros and you, you make these arguments, or you go to Apache and you make these arguments about the defaults. And there tends to be, I don't want to pick on any one party here, but there tends to be a lot of pushback. That, oh, well, we have legacy reasons. We have compatibility reasons. We have these huge groups of users we need to consider. And it's like, well, that's not good enough. You know, this is 2014, Edward Snowden happened, and you're still shipping something that's insecure by default. And because you want 0.2% better interoperability with, you know, IE5 or whatever it is. I really think we can do better than that. But I think that takes a coordinated effort by the web community to go to those operating system and, and other communities and say, no, this isn't good enough. No, we haven't quite seen that yet. Right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. I heard uh, a few good ideas to take home. Uh, the future of opportunistic encryption. Uh, that'll be good when we get there. It's a big old or, question. Well, yeah. it'll be, yeah. there'll be some challenges. Yeah. Uh, I heard SSL Mate, uh, SSL Labs, and IndieWeb. So some interesting uh, items to take home on that. Uh, so jumping right along, no shortage of security challenges uh, in the world or internet. Uh, this next question, <coughs> uh, paraphrased from, I'll try my best, Yoav Weiss. Uh, passwords are increasingly seen as an anti-pattern. What are ideal alternatives? And uh, Chris, you spent a lot of time uh, with identity. Yeah. Uh, what has your experience brought you to on this, uh, this area? I mean, it is sad that like, we keep talking about being in 2014. Um, and I feel like the last time I worked on this problem was seven years ago. And it's, I mean, and there was a person seven years before me that worked on it and back to like the Stone Age. So um, it just doesn't seem to be a problem that is going to solve itself, certainly. Um, and I think similar to like the problem that you were pointing out and that Alex was pointing out with like the, you know, the distros, um, it comes down to economics, behavioral economics, um, as well as sort of business model economics. The, the password anti-pattern is something that we identified when um, APIs were st first starting to be released in the 2005 to 2007 era of the golden web, um, back when they drove big cars with whale skin hubcaps. Um, and uh, sorry, if you don't get that reference, it's even longer than that. Anyways, um, the problem, of course, is like it's really easy for users to like remember one little string. Of course, if they put it in like the password recovery field, anyways, then like it's uh, <laughs> that's an amazing slide, by the way. Anyways, uh, back when APIs were getting out, like Basic was the only way to do this authentication against these different like service providers. And the problem was that users would reuse the same password everywhere. And so this became a password anti-pattern because if any one of those chains was broken, effectively all of your security was then screwed. Um, and so we started a campaign in conjunction with OpenID to try to get people to switch over to something that was more of a centralized authentication model. And so your 
OpenID provider, your identity provider, essentially could be as secure as you want it to be or as insecure as you chose to allow it to be. So if you chose not to have a password on your OpenID server, <coughs> you could do that. It would just be an open redirector and people did that um, to sort of prove that OpenID was broken or whatever. Um, the problem, though, is that getting people to change their behavior or to understand the risks that are actually out there in the world or to make them even stop for a moment to think that if they pick up their device, they're opening themselves up to all sorts of vulnerabilities is something that actually just crushes the entire world and universe and their mind sort of melts. <laughs> and um, as a UX designer, it's really difficult to try to address that problem through user education, for example, by you know, telling them that this is a terrible thing. Um, so the ways in which you may, I'll give you some answers, the ways in which you may sort of address this uh, would be through two-factor authentication, through behavioral um, tracking, so understanding user's behavior, through third-party validation, um, or I had another one, but I forget, so right. there you go. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot. We'll, we'll pause yeah. on that. Um, Natasha, can mobile help? We've got this device in our pocket. Does it help us at all here? Yeah, I, I, there's a few things that are happening within this area right now. And um, initially, I was a little bit skeptical about this, about moving, moving something from being in the cloud and being able to log into various uh, services wherever you are to going to being reliant on perhaps some hardware token. Um, or some piece of hardware, but then you're right. It's true. Uh, many of us, are, most of us, are carrying a mobile around with us. Some people now uh, have watches that they are using as well um, in a similar way. So there is some argument to say that why don't we utilize those things that allow us to log into various services? And on top of the stuff that was happening at um, OpenID <coughs> Connect and the OAuth stuff in IETF, um, there's a lot of work going on with in another organization called the FIDO Alliance, um, which is using a lot of uh, PKI, uh, was using PKI to actually do the, the authentication to allow you to log in, but when you log in, you, you, you sort of do something on the device. So it sends a challenge to the device, and then the device can ask you to, to, uh, to identify yourself through that challenge, but it could be anything. It could be a fingerprint scan, it could be a password, it could be um, an interpretive dance, it doesn't matter. It could be anything. Uh, it's it's what, you know, what that device chooses to be and what you decide to then use. And then the PKI would then go through and then you're able to log in through the site. Um, but Chris is right. Uh, getting users to accept this is very difficult. I know um, Mozilla had a, a really great system with their persona, and what happened to that was really quite unfortunate. Um, the technology was really fantastic, but users just didn't <coughs> get it. They, he's right. They, they, they didn't get it, and that kind of sort of died out because of that, and it was a shame. So maybe that's where we need to focus some efforts on, is that education. Do you think that's a technology problem or a UI problem? <sighs> See, I, I, I think it probably is a UI problem, but I, I'm not too sure if I'd describe it as UI or educational. It's, it's okay. Well, maybe you're by the look of your face, the same thing. Um, so, uh, it, it, it was getting them to understand that this was still safe. I think many, many standard users will go ahead and think I should put in a username and I should put in a password. That is secure. If I'm clicking something and it's allowing me in. That's gonna. That what? That's not something I want to use. That's insecure. And then, you know, going back to the HTTP argument, I, I think that most users would ignore the bar and, and just um, it would ignore HTTP, and they want to see a username and they want to see a password, and that's to them triggers secure. And they'll think that is more secure than HTTPS <coughs> and a big green bar and a button to say just log in. That just it, it just doesn't work. So would we would we solve these problems if we? have a magical system that generates strong passwords for users and saves them in some way, like the password managers that are built in the browsers? I don't know. I think I like password managers, but I like password managers right now. I think it's a, it's a good stopgap to move forward, and I think more of the future stuff is more of this OpenID Connect FIDO Alliance. There's more, more PKI, more of the stuff that Mozilla was trying to do, but that was it's almost just came a little bit too early. So I think we should still push for that. But yeah, OK, so going back to your original point, yes, it's, it's a UI thing. Maybe we just need to make it a little bit more obvious and a little bit more easy for those users to understand. It's also, it's also like a timing and context thing. I mean, like again, like the, the API sort of interoperability and, and integration between lots of different apps and services was a big sort of driver and pusher for OAuth, for example. And that, that pattern, the, the previous pattern, had to be defeated. The things that are happening now with mobile and like Touch ID and stuff like that, I think are going to train a generation of users to not only like hate passwords, but to not want to type ever, ever again. Mm -hmm. And they'll only talk to their device. 
you know, like in Star Trek or something. <laughs> and if you're speaking your plain text password, which is no more plain text, it's plain speech, that doesn't make sense either. So we sort of have to migrate to where users are going. We've in some ways lived in the future about our security awareness for a long time, you know, sort of using Stone Age tools to authenticate ourselves. But I think as devices get better and they become more ubiquitous and users' expectations change on how they actually interact with the devices, that creates this opportunity to actually implement the things that were relevant 10 years ago now. It's just that it hasn't sort of lined up yet. If you, if you look at the adoption of the fingerprint scanners on iPhones, I mean, is that the direction forward? The user doesn't have to think about anything but just touch this, yeah. and perhaps that's tied into a password manager. Uh, is but, this the direction we're going, or? But that's tied into Apple. I mean, you know, you're, yeah. you're owned by Apple there. Well, but just, just evaluate the UX, though, right? Sure. So if, if I, I think. It's becoming successful because it's Apple. Not, what's also interesting yeah. about it, though, is that, you know, it, it creates a type of, it's, it's interesting, there's a behavior element to it where you can actually have multiple fingerprints that are authenticated to a device. So for example, if I have kids or if I have a you know, spouse or whatever, and I want them to be able to authenticate purchases, uh -huh. I don't have to share a password. Wait, is that with the new, with the iOS 8? Well, so there's family sharing, which is actually addressing the... Because you just sold it, if so, you just sold me a new iPhone if that's the case. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. the family sharing thing will be interesting to see how that actually okay. works in terms of shared uh, authentication. But you could actually add multiple fingers, which you didn't have to own. So I could have had your finger and my finger. <laughs> and I'm just saying, like, all of a sudden, we have a very interesting touch device. But sure. the point is, it allows for a different way of managing passwords, which people do. Like, people share their Amazon passwords. One of the biggest things that I've noticed about, oh, I saw this in the reviews for Find My Friends. If you guys like go to the App Store, check it out. There's a lot of one-star reviews because people would say that actually I allowed my spouse to sort of log in under my account using the same password, and you've removed that feature. So the sharing of a password is actually move, like removing a feature, and so if you have to do two-factor authentication, you've actually disabled functionality that people rely on. So there's a greater context here that I think Let's needs to be uh, get an oh. uh, audience member lined up too. <coughs> um, no, that, uh, uh, that spends the, the point about you know, having multiple um, sort of assurance levels almost. That so right. you say, there's certain things, so, so logging into my phone might be, you know, I, I have I password protected a lot of the, or, or protected a lot of the more insecure applications on my phone. So maybe I just want to log into my phone really quickly because I just want to tell when I need to turn left mm -hmm. next or turn right, right or check a text message or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there's going to be other things like looking at my bank account, which I want mm -hmm. to be very, very secure. And in which case, then those different assurance levels mm -hmm. needs to come in and there mm -hmm. needs to be method. And there are, people are looking at methods there to, to focus on that. And it's not just about multiple different passwords or copying out the number on the front of your card, um, but having those different levels and different checks with different resources. Uh, Ada, perfect. What do, you, what do you got for us? Um, you can assume your password is available um, um, from, a, from a database you can purchase online, uh, <laughs> matched to your favorite um, usernames and emails. So is it even uh, useful to use a password in a world in which uh, you can use two-factor authentication? Yes. I mean, part of it, again, is, is cost, right? So if you're building an application or if you're building a stupid, I'm not going to name any names, like <laughs> iOS app, for example, um, and you just want to get something out the door, security is not a big deal. You basically want to like, you know, avoid someone else taking a selfie on your behalf, right? You don't necessarily need to throw in two-factor authentication, put that huge speed bump in. You're going to have such a, a grade of loss of signups. I mean, like, even where it's like, you know, connect with Twitter to log in or whatever, that extra speed bump actually inhibits adoption a lot. So again, from a cost benefit analysis, I think you have to look at it from that perspective. We got a lot of interest. I'm going to take a, another topic here before we move on. Uh, Guy, here we are. Just want to talk a little bit about continuous authentication. So when, you know, with the Internet of Things and all the wearables and those components, you know, still everything you talked about was around prompted authentication when somebody <coughs> logs in. Granted, it's easier to, uh, to press your, you know, put your finger to something than type in a password or voice it. But still, do we need something that sort of constantly tracks us, not in the privacy sense of the word, but rather locally and, and authenticates? No, but, uh, I, I mean, absolutely. The, like, the difference is, is who is doing the tracking, right? Like, we have, this is not necessarily communicated out. I mean, this is just something local that takes right. a, a, a biometric indicator or, or some other form. Maybe it's a presence of a device or whatever it is, uh, but is a little bit more continuous. So as I take the right turn, I know they need to be stopped. But I think eventually users, the user's goal is not to be secure, it's to complete whatever it is that the action that they're doing. So we need security to be as seamless as possible as a part of that. Um, and that may imply something that doesn't require prompting them. 
the credit card companies already do this. You know, they yeah. track where you are to figure out what your credit card purchases make sense. I was in, in Istanbul two weeks ago, and uh, uh, somebody's credit card didn't work, and so they went and called the bank. And the bank said, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, we can see you're in Istanbul, and you're leaving on such and such date. And the thing is, they hadn't told the bank that they were going to make that trip. The airline company shared the ticket data with the bank automatically, and it wasn't opt-in. And so that's like... Oh, I'm sure there was an opt-in. You whoa. just checked the box. Well, yeah, there's a box yeah, way the down box. deep or there's yeah, an opt-out, yeah, yeah. but yeah. they didn't remember doing but it. the terms were in there. Right, yeah. you know, in that 14,000 pages exactly. of text. Right. Yeah. That's right. And so that's a really interesting world to live in because the European, European people I was with were freaking out. They're like, that's illegal. I was freaking out. I live in Australia, that's illegal. But in the U.S., yeah. hey, that's convenient. You know, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well... You know, we got a lot of topics, uh, a lot of interest on this one, but we're going to keep charging forward. I'm, I'm not surprised that there's a, a plenty of opinions on, on passwords. <laughs> uh, you know, some of the things I heard so far, though, is we really have to work on usability and make it seamless uh, and appropriate. You know, easy when it needs to be and even more robust when it needs to be. Uh, moving on, um, our third question comes from uh, Ben Vinegar. Google now uses HTTPS as a ranking signal and server worker is HTTPS only. Both are likely to increase HTTPS adoption. Are there other security-minded features that should be incentivized in this manner? And so it feels like, as we take this question, we're shifting slightly away from the security that's in the <coughs> user's face, like passwords were, but more to what should our applications and websites be doing automatically? Because um, you know, the sad reality is they're kind of doing just as much as they need to, and maybe not even that. But this seems like an incentive model that may make them want to do more for security. Sure. I think that I, I think it's a really interesting uh, idea by the search team to start promoting in a small way HTTPS. I think that there are like search-related reasons that they do this because you need to ensure that the content that you're delivering to the user is actually the content that you expect to be delivered to the user. So HTTPS gives you the some sort of verification that you are in fact talking to CNN.com and you're not talking to the NSA who's injecting stories about uh, how awesome the NSA is onto the front page of CNN.com. To make you happier. To make you happier, exactly. Yeah. So I think that there there are like qual search quality related reasons to do uh, to do this particular action. I don't think it's only about <coughs> promoting HTTPS. I think that there are like other reasons. So I think that for search engines in particular, you would have to find other quality related reasons that you would uh, promote. And one of those might be mixed content. So if you have mixed content on the page, then you are in fact degrading the quality of the, uh, of the uh, HTTPS uh, encryption because you're loading insecure resources into a secure context. So perhaps we could start looking at that. Um, HSTS would be nice because then you can ensure that there's uh, strict transport security means that you can't execute a downgrade attack. You can't force someone onto HTTP from an HTTPS website. You say this website should always be HTTPS. Uh, that gives a pretty solid guarantee that you are in fact talking to the server uh, that you expect to be talking to. So these sorts of things are things that would be nice to promote in some way. Yeah, and, and on the, the standard side, you know, there's more and more capabilities that people are talking about making HTTPS only or preferring HTTPS. And I think a lot of that's because, you know, the, the Google uh, or the Chrome team recently brought up that policy which was proposing amongst all the browsers that powerful new facilities are by default secure or only secure. Um, and, and I think that's because, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of subtlety to security where people say, oh, I don't need HTTPS for that because I'm doing this and not realizing that there are lots of other very subtle attack vectors or it might be the user themselves that wants the security rather than the site and its content wanting the security. You know, the, the, the use case that comes up in the ITF, and there was actually a draft about this as well, you know, imagine a search engine and, you know, yes, you can, you know, that's a public data that you're getting. So it doesn't have any inherent issues around the data you're getting. But if you're uh, a gay teenager in Nigeria and you're searching about, you know, being gay and or AIDS or whatever, that can get you killed. And so security really does matter there for reasons that the, the service provider might not anticipate. Why don't we jump out uh, to the audience? We have uh, Mark. Hello. Here we are. Um, I was wondering, is the obsession with web performance setting back security practices? And are there rampant misconceptions about uh, the trade-off between security and performance that you feel need to be corrected. So, Ilya's in the audience somewhere. He has a yeah, really... Yeah, if, if Ilya's here, just to give him the mic. <laughs> <laughs> See here? Okay, so anyway, uh, Ilya has a great website called istlsfast.com. Uh, <laughs> 
Is TLS yet. fast yet? I'm sorry. Is TLS fast yet? Dot com, and that answers some of the questions around the speed at which or the, the speed impact of TLS. And I think that uh, Ilya's got a really great resource there, so I would highly recommend that you read it. It answers um, all the questions yeah. pretty much. There's yeah. some work going on in this area, though. Well, there's TLS 1.3, yeah. um, and that's trying to get down to zero round trip or one round trip. Right. Fast open and... Well, that's TLS 1.3, yeah. really, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, I mean, there's experimentation with protocols as well, so if you look at Quick, uh, they're also trying to do zero round trip. Um, and that's based on a different thing that I don't remember that was also doing something right. similar. So. There's a lot of talk about UDP-based HTTP yeah, exactly. in general, and that's again about performance yeah. uh, whilst not trading off security. Yeah. There was some use cases though mentioned in HTTP, sorry, at the IETF <coughs> about there being some slow, well, for, for people that perhaps use satellite connections and stuff and that causes a massive issue. The current situation with, with TLS. There, there are certainly some unusual deployment scenarios. Yeah. Um, that's more about those people wanting to get inside and do optimizations on the data mm -hmm. and not being able to do that when there's encryption present. And that opens a whole other can of worms about yeah. security and the relationships happening there. It's certainly an interesting question as that, uh, tying it back to the, uh, the incentivizing HTTPS. If we incentivize security, uh, we have to overcome the perceptions of those challenges. Uh, and realities in some cases. Yeah, yeah and realities, and, exactly. And I think we're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jonas. There comes the mic. Uh, yeah, the HTML also has some weird old anti features where, like, back in the day, HTTPS was considered like the bank side, bank websites technology. And so it turns off things like referrers and um, does various other things that I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, there is work to fix some of these things. So there's like a meta refer spec now where you can like say that even though I'm HTTPS, I'm actually just a normal website. Please, you know, send refer links. Um, but I, I suspect there are more work like that that needs to be done as well. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of different parts of the web security model that hang off of that decision to have that little S there. And and yeah, I agree. It'd be nice to pick that apart a little bit where it's appropriate. So we got one uh, one more person up there, uh, Patrick. There we are, up here in the front. There we go. Hi. Uh, Natasha mentioned earlier one of the issues with um, persona failing was kind of a, uh, a, a users inherently not thinking it was secure because you weren't entering a password. So I was wondering how much does sort of security theater come into play when designing secure interfaces, making things actually think they're secure as opposed to being secure? UX as security theater, I guess? Yeah. yeah. We, we do our best to, <coughs> in browsers, promote the things that we know to be secure and promote the things that uh, help us make things more secure. So there is absolutely security theater in the browser, like the EV certificates that we talked about earlier. They are completely the same encryption as normal certificates, but they're green, so they must be better, right? <laughs> uh, that sort of thing is good because it helps us do things like CT. Uh, it helps us work better with the uh, certificate authorities. So doing those sorts of things uh, as kind of harmless security theater is kind of okay. Um, but generally speaking, we want to build interfaces that promote the things that are actually secure and make the guarantees that we know we can actually make. So I hope that we don't do things that are strictly security theater, but I definitely think that we need to think about the ways that users interact with web pages and use, interact with the user agent in order to ensure that the things that we, the, the behaviors that we promote are in fact the ones that we want to promote and not the alternative. Part, part of the problem is like, you know, there's a, a, a huge generation of people that have grown up expecting username and password, password being concealed, as being the way to understand that something is actually safe. So for example, one of the experiments that we did back in the OpenID days, you know, because you just type in a URL and that's how you would authenticate, um, was you could type in an email address and there'd be a password box beneath it. And of course, we would drop off the username and we'd drop off the password and we'd just sort of ignore those things and drop them on the floor and send you over to the URL that you'd sort of um, typed in as your email address. It was somewhat confusing to users, but that meant that those uh, services that were uh, willing to participate in that were actually sort of preserving a little more of the user security by not, at, not creating another surface area for them to be exposed and entering the same password again. So it's not perfect, but in some ways, tricking people into being more secure, if it actually converts better, is a better thing to do. Well, I'll pause on that because we're actually going to get into it even more in this very next question. Great. 
Um, but it sounds like there's consensus that incentivizing security is really pretty good. I didn't hear any objections at all. I, I think it's really hard on mobile. Yeah. Like okay. mobile. Yeah. UX on mobile yeah. is yep. not there Efficiency yet. Efficiency is like so important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. So uh, in, in terms of uh, the original question, other features, it sounds like mixed, mixed content might be the next one to uh, start charging down. If we're going to incentivize SSL, let's take it to the next degree and make sure it's a good SSL connection. Yeah. Note that I am not on the search team. <laughs> for clarity. Great. Uh, so why don't we move into our next question, um, brought to us by Matt Andrews. What signals should the browser communicate to users regarding their security? So no doubt uh, diving into UX uh, security theater or not. For example, should we warn users about personal information, information submissions? Should imperfect HTTPS be flagged differently than plain HTTP? What would, any, what would a non-techie user respond to? Um, and Jan, I think you know, with your with your work on HTTPS everywhere and some of those items, this might be very relevant for you. Yeah. Well, I, th I think the answer to this question is hugely different, um, depending on whether the user is someone technical who knows what mixed content is, versus someone who barely knows what the lock icon means. Right? There's only so many icons you can put there before people just say, like, I don't understand what this icon means. I'm going to ignore this square entirely. So uh, my fear is we've already saturated at that point, and we can't really add any more Peak icons. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else. So one, one thing I did wor work on at EFF that's tangentially related is uh, displaying to people when third parties are tracking them. So uh, this is, yeah, this is also a security feature, not in the same way as HTTPS, but if you think about how much data you're leaking to third parties, you know, in often ca cases, that's a security risk. Um, and it, it turns out people do really like seeing what third parties are tracking them. And um, I think Mozilla has done some work with a project called Lightbeam to help people see like, what the connections are between the various first party sites you're visiting and the third party sites. Yeah. So that's a cool space to move in. Yeah, yeah that can also be tackled um, regulatory. I know this is a technical conference, so I'll just spend a little bit of time on that. At least in Japan, there's a, it's a guideline. It's not actually law, but there's a guideline to say that any application uh, that takes any personal data or, or basically uses any permissions needs to state um, to the user before they download it uh, who the, uh, what permissions is being taken, what data is being taken, who that data then gets sent to, and roughly what that data is going to be used for. So there is some regulation going on in that area. It would be better if it was tackled mm -hmm. technically, but that's an interesting case from a, right. from a different country. I mean, that's, it, it, it's sort of the tension between the economics of the problems that can result from uh, security violations or, or the breakdowns of things um, compared with the overall UX sort of experience, the you know, creating a wonderful experience, I think is this huge, enormous tension. And whether it's through regulations or through like laws or things like that that require or demand certain disclosures to be made, you know, ultimately you're gonna be affecting people's businesses and business models and their ability to actually you know, offer the services that they're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this actually comes down, but most users, and you know, I, um, I am somewhat OCD about looking at uh, authorization screens. If you go to my Flickr account, which is under Factory Joe, um, search for Facebook authorization, and I have like all of the generations of the Facebook Connect dialogues. Um, in the beginning, in the beginning, there was lots of words and lots of disclosure and you know tons of information. And now, of course, you get to this place where it's like you know your face and like you know your information is going to be sent over there. Is that cool? You know, they like added this button where it's like you know edit your information. Most people don't care. I worked on like the Google authorization dialogues. Like, it's extremely difficult to communicate this information in an efficient, effective way to get people to care and to actually be part of the the dialogue and conversation with you know to understand the relationship that they're having with these different providers. It becomes just so over their heads, and it's so provides so little value to what they're trying to do right. that providing this in a contextual way is, is difficult. So that said, there are sort of reactive ways of dealing with this, as Google does, where they send out, <coughs> um, what is it, your, your statement or whatever, your data access statement or something. So maybe from like an auditing perspective, if you have sort of a centralized identity provider, whether it's Facebook, Google, Twitter, whatever, here are the apps that are asking for your information. Here's what we think they've done with it. Here are the number of your friends who have actually uninstalled or stopped using these apps. And here's what consumer reports, if they were doing their job in this, in this space, could tell you about what's happened to people have, who have given their, their information to these places. So there's just not a lot of other ways in which we're looking at giving this information to people that might be more effective. Right. And I think getting back to the idea of 
what we can do in the browser. I think both of you are mentioning that we've already put too much in the browser, and I think we should start taking things away. For instance, why do we flag HTTPS as being good? Why don't we flag HTTP as being bad? Right. Uh, I think that we can start making it more clear that uh, certain behaviors are good, uh, or not not good, but default. This should secure, be expected. Right. Default, right. Like, and both, I think both Mozilla and, and Google are looking at uh, are looking at that bar and trying to figure out what we can do in order to encourage the behaviors that we think are really secure and discourage the behaviors that aren't secure. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Like, like Yen did the, the HTTPS Everywhere plug, you work on that, but you also did the HTTP Nowhere extension, which I love, which yeah. is your browser will refuse to navigate to HTTP sites. Right. And I want to live in a world where that's normal, where I don't have to explain to my wife and kids, you know, that yes, you have to look for the lock icon. Right. And maybe I won't live in that world, but maybe my kids will, you know, where the web is just encrypted by default and it doesn't work if it's not encrypted, it just breaks. Yeah, it really gets to an interesting question uh, about this, about what we should communicate. Should we ever put users in a situation where they are making security decisions? Right. Aren't they always going to want the, the secure path? Right. Is, there, is there any reason we should ever ask them? Well, yeah, Natasha? I mean, websites screw up. <laughs> and it's certainly possible for you to need to get to a website. Uh, and like, for example, OnSlide. I went to OnSlide this morning. Yeah, and OnSlide, <laughs> the link was to OnSlide.com. Yeah. But if you look at the cert details, it was for www.onslide.com. Right. And I can make that distinction and say, well, they're actually the same thing and right. click through. Mm -hmm. uh, Chrome is making it more difficult for me to click through. I now have to right. click on <coughs> advanced and then read some text. And then down in like light gray text at the bottom of the page, mm -hmm. uh, there's the continue button. So we're discouraging that activity to whatever extent possible. And we allow the server to tell us that we should uh, completely disable it. So if you set up HSTS, then we won't give you that option to continue because they've asked for strict security. So we're going to give them strict security. Um, but for normal web pages, it's, it's really tough to make a complete blocking action uh, because the web is a difficult place and things break. Yeah, it sounds difficult to say that we'll, we will then go ahead and start blocking sites when the web is such an open place and accessing information and sharing information is, is the idea of the web and now we're saying, oh no, no, but we're going to block these ones. And I, the intentions are great, don't get me wrong, it's just, it, it's very hard to make that decision to go and say. So uh, the things that the Chrome, uh, the search team are doing at Google about saying, okay, well, we'll reorder stuff. And you say, cool, we know that this is a CNN link, great, that's fantastic. But that's a, a very common use case, but there, there is a small percentage chance that that some un, more unreliable data will reach to the top under the, the data that, over the data that you actually want to find. So it's, quite, it's a little bit difficult. We need to think about it. I, I, would, I would support that point like, from a different perspective, which yeah. is to say that the web you know, is a tinkerer's like, paradise in a sense. And we're asking people to take a greater degree of responsibility for understanding and knowing all the different ways in which it can fail rather than the ways in which you can get something out of the world. Yeah. And so I think if you, you build a tax on all this other we're talking right. about to sort of make it safer and better for everyone, but you increase the cost of the ability to publish to it, then you will have more people building native apps because it's cheaper, easier, and it feels better right. to do that. We're, we're, we're really, what we're looking at is we're embarking on a very long-term effort to encourage better behaviors by default, right. to have best practices, to little pushes here and yeah. there. It's, it's not something that's gonna happen overnight or even in three or four years or even five or 10 years, right. but it has to happen. Go out to the audience here, uh, Dominic. Is open. It's, it's great that the web is open and, and we can use all these obsolete technologies, but you know, we can't use HTTP 0 0.9 anymore. We can't use Gopher anymore. Yeah, sure. Like One of these days, we shouldn't be able to use unencrypted HTTP anymore, and I think that's totally fine. And, and as Mark says, it may be a longer-term effort, but it doesn't worry me. It doesn't seem like an openness issue if you can't use these legacy technologies, uh, at, at least on that level. I mean, yeah, we're still trying to kill show modal dialogue, but you know, whatever. I mean, that, that's a fair point. Does Does open mean we have to leave behind, we have to keep using all these things that are horribly insecure, aren't helping us at all, or can we make progress forward? I, well, I think you just need to think about with, well, are you going to use a carrot or a stick? Like, that's just, that's the thing. It's like, uh, I, you know, shutting HTTP data off sounds like a bit of a stick method to me. I, I think you, we, need, we need a few more carrots. Well, I guess my, my claim would be that if you want to use Gopher, go download a Gopher program, and you can still access all the Gopher servers that are probably still up. Right. Um, and you will be taking that risk, and that's right. fine. And again, it's an incremental thing. I mean, one of the things I've been talking to people a little bit about is, you know, privacy mode. If I'm in privacy mode and I go and see an HTTP site, 
you know, or, or some sort of security-centric mode. If I've given the browser a signal that, hey, I'm really concerned about my, my personal privacy and security, maybe the browser should not let me use an HTTP site. So it's kind of an opt-in thing. You know, that's, it's an incremental way to get there, yeah, rather so than just I, shutting it off one night. Yeah, so if I'm, I'm very, because the, one of the things I was going to say earlier about, I think sometimes one of the biggest issues is users being in a hurry. Like they click through because there's, I, you know, I need something right now. I need to download Uber right now because right. I need a taxi right now. Like I don't care, you know, it, it doesn't matter what I'm clicking through. I just, I need to get somewhere now. And that's, I think, they don't read, they click through and, and that's a big issue. And, and that's, it's interesting you, you bring that up. I mean, yeah, that's true for a lot of users. Yeah. And security people I talk to sometimes get into this little bit of a, a mindset of absolutism where everything has to be secure all the time. Whereas for a large number of users on the planet, you know, they are willing to make trade-offs and the problem is they're not educated about those trade-offs. Mm. There's a smaller population on the planet who are very concerned about security and privacy and they have good reason to be for various reasons. And we need to give them good tools too. Mm -hmm. So we'll move into a into our next question here. This next question actually is going to pull together a few different ideas we've talked about, uh, both user experience, uh, SSL, <coughs> uh, and the, uh, the mobile experience, or, or at least moving around where you connect to the net. Uh, so brought to us from Cornell Lesinski. Uh, what, should we, what should we allow intermediaries, such as mobile operator proxies, Wi-Fi hotspots, corporate gateways, et cetera, to see and do to user traffic? I would suggest that we let them do whatever the user enables them to do, or whatever the administrator who exerts executive control over the machine uh, allows, right. which basically means that if it's over HTTPS, they shouldn't be able to do anything to it unless a cert has been installed in the root store of the machine, because that means that someone exerted administrative control over the machine and said, this is the right thing for you to do. Go through this mobile proxy. That's going to you know, change everything. So you're saying a coffee spot, a coffee, coffee shop wireless shop. should not be able to intercept, Never. do a man in the middle, throw all the Never. warnings, train people to click through? Never, ever. And, and that's the, we've talked about this a lot in, in the HTTP working group, and that's the model we've kind of resolved on is, is that you know, it's, HTTPS is explicitly end-to-end -end secure. It's not end-to-end -end and maybe this guy comes in the middle and has a chat. Um, and, and, and so the, the CA, the trust store in the browser is a really fundamental mechanism. Now, as we were talking about last night, you know, we can improve the trust store a lot. It, the user experience around that's pretty bad right now. But that's kind of the model we're working towards. Yeah. I, you know, just it, it occurs to me again, like I, I tend to think about a lot of things from an economic perspective. And there is an economic benefit or reason why the coffee shop would sort of like intersperse their thing with like ads or whatever. People are unwilling to pay for Wi-Fi or something like that, or if they have to pay for Wi-Fi um, to be able to get online because people aren't buying enough coffee, you know? So I think that the, the challenge, back to your point about whether it's a carrot or a stick, is unclear. Whether or not it should be like, you know, legally, like illegal to sort of break the stuff and sort of like have these captive portals, in which case it's a very different type of enforcement model, or if it's like a carrot thing where it's like, you know, yeah. uh, users have a different attitude and they just shut it down if they don't want to like be Personally, I'm not it. terribly interested in the legal uh, or sure. legislative. Nor am I suggesting I'm looking that. at technical solutions yeah. where it's not possible sure. to get in the middle. Yeah. Sure. How does this uh, play out? I mean, the coffee house is one example, but the corporate environment mm -hmm. um, where the company wants to step in and say, I'm going to intercept this connection to this unrelated site yep. that otherwise we have HSTS. We never want this to happen. But, but it, as Mike said, you know, the, if the company owns the machine, yeah. They insert something in the trust store, you sign a contract that says, I'm your employee, I know that you're going to sniff my stuff, and if you're smart, you don't go to your bank over your company computer. Yeah. So or really or if, you're a prison, if you're in a prison or if you're in a school, they're often the same sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, you have that relationship. So we're really going to the extreme of what's allowed, but may not match user expectations. Right. Right? I think users uh, perhaps well, are not expecting that even in the enterprise. Whether or not they should. Let's go back to the checkbox, though. You know, for like the the airfare thing or whatever. Like, you yeah. know, where where you checked a box at some right. point. And the problem is that we have very little agency to actually sort of like fight back on that. You know, where my lawyer talks to like you know the, the <coughs> apps lawyer and says, actually, these terms I disagree with. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to like sniff my stuff, even though right. I work for you. Yeah. All right, uh, we're running short on time, but let's get a few audience participants on this uh, most likely last question. There we go. Hi. Uh, just regarding uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, um, the captive portal situation, if they, even if they're not trying to intercept the traffic itself, they are trying to intercept the first session, mm -hmm. 
And currently, when I'm on the road trying to log on to a random Wi-Fi, I go to websites that are that I know they are HTTP. Otherwise, it just yep. blocks. Yep. So uh, are there any plans to standardize on that and make uh, that work? Yeah, we, we've had some, some background discussions about this amongst a couple of different vendors to try and improve. We, everyone's very keenly aware of that, that that's a problem. Um, getting the right people in the room, uh, and especially because you need the Wi-Fi networks, you need the vendors creating those captive portals, you need the operating system folks and sometimes the browser folks. It, it's really hard to get everybody in one place, but we're working towards that. It, it's not going to be anytime soon, unfortunately. But yeah, it's a problem. Okay, so yeah. okay. sorry. <laughs> See, and we had a, another qu question from the uh, or comment from the audience. Uh, there we are. I'm wondering what can we do to give better visibility into what intermediaries are installed. So even if somebody has exerted administrative control over your device, that doesn't mean that I am necessarily aware of it. I've heard rumors of uh, carriers installing things, even my, like I may not be aware that when I pick up a device and I install my corporate thing that all of my traffic is going through a corporate proxy and I may be doing very private things that I like, maybe I want to opt out, right? Maybe I want a different route. How do we make that better? So I, I, there are two parts to that. I think one is, is like we're talking about, improving the user experience around the trust store. So I can say, well, this CA trust it for these sites, but not for you know arbitrary other sites, for example. And and then there's been some background chatter uh, for a long time now about doing uh, things like end-to-end -end signatures in HTTP, where you can sign content for integrity or or have multiple layers of encryption, things like that. And there are a lot of people really interested in that. Um, getting the browser guys interested in that is a little harder so far, but there's a lot of interest there. Yeah, so I, I think part of my question is maybe it's more to the vendors, to the browsers, uh, because it seems like sometimes, and grant that this is probably an advanced use case, but there are cases where I would like to opt out sometimes. It, this is not a question about end to end has somebody manipulated the content. It's, like, it's the fact that it was seen by somebody else, right? It, so you went through a proxy. I want to opt out sometimes. Like maybe. I don't want specific type of traffic to be seen by my corporate proxy. Yeah, so with, with Chrome, we don't have any UI for proxies. But I know that on Android, if there is a cert installed in the trust store that isn't one of the pre-installed certs, then there's a persistent notification up in the top bar that shows you that your device is owned by someone else and that it's completely possible for your traffic to be uh, routed through someone who can read it. Uh, we don't have that on Chrome OS, I believe. And I don't think we have it on desktop either, because that's really an OS level thing. Uh, and it's something that I think the operating system needs to deal with. But you're entirely correct. The browsers can and probably should <coughs> figure out ways of making it clear to users that their traffic is not secure. And maybe that's something that we do in the address bar. Uh, maybe we don't make any sites green if there's a, a cert installed. I don't know. I think so there are. There are open bugs for this in Chrome and in Firefox, and it's been quite contentious from what I saw. Yeah. I mean, in, you know, there are two sides to it. I don't really understand the negatives as well as I understand the positives of doing what you want to do there. But well, you know. uh, I think an interesting point to uh, wrap things up, um, uh, an item of security, of usability, some contention on different sides. Um, you know, hopefully we had some good discussion here. Uh, I think there's a lot of good ideas around how do we incentivize security so people want to do it. How do we balance the user experience so they know what's happening? How do we operate in a model so what happens to users they're aware of and, and they think that's correct or, or aware if it's not? But I really wanted to thank everyone on the panel, everyone in the audience, for good comments and questions. I think we'll leave it there for today. Thank you.